So uh, um, when I hear you listing all of the problems that we're having, and my shoulders are going up around my ears, and I'm thinking, yikes, we're in trouble. And, but I know that you and I are going to turn a corner now, and you're going to now tell us about some of the ways that each of us can start to make a difference in the lives of children, and that this isn't just your idea, there's evidence for that. So we're going to be going through that and, and taking your questions in a little while as well. So jot down any questions that you have. Um, before we start really burrowing into that, though, uh, what is the good news? What, what, just overarching, what do we know now that we didn't know maybe even 10 years ago about how we can help children in this way? Right. So, um, you know, there's a lot. And, uh, and in fact, I see some of my students in my course. I teach entire courses about this topic. So I'm, you're getting my you know, you know, cliff notes here. But um, there's really three recent innovations. If I had to sort of boil it down, I'd say there's three recent innovations that really have helped us move for, further. And, and this research in the area of social and emotional learning, I have to tell you, it's so new. The science. So as I said before, We've always had these ideas, and in fact, if you think of a quote, Aristotle quoted, educating the mind without educating the heart is no education at all. But really, we now have the science. So first of all, what we know is that these skills, this um, social and emotional learning, these things like self-awareness and compassion and empathy, that they're malleable, meaning that it isn't like you're born with something and you, can't, you're, you have it for life. They're malleable. You can kind of teach them, and I don't want to, I sort of want to talk about the teach. It isn't exactly always teaching, like sitting them down and, you know, making right compassion 10 times, <laughs> um, you know, anything like that. But um, so one of the uh, most interesting recent research studies, and it's amazing, we have to figure out some way to get these on the web. So people, like if I mention it, people will go, I want to find that one Kim mentioned. So, um, so first of all, there's a place called the um, Collaborative for Academic and Social and Emotional Learning, CASEL. It's in Chicago. It's, uh, the website is www.casel.org, and it's kind of the mothership of this kind of stuff. And, and um, uh, last year, 2011, they released a meta-analysis. Um, and a meta-analysis means you take many, 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 many research studies. So they actually took 213 research studies of social and emotional learning in classrooms. And they did it in, in, in if you looked at all the students that were in those, there were 270,000 students. And they looked at uh, studies in which children had received a social and emotional learning program. So they were in a classroom in which they promoted their self-awareness, compassion, social awareness, and control groups. So they looked at, had these two groups. And what they found was astounding. Um, first of all, what they found is that children in the SEL classrooms had higher levels of social and emotional skills, fewer behavior problems, more connection to school, all of these wonderful things. But the fascinating part was is that they also found that students in these SEL programs had achievement test scores that were 11 percentile points higher. Because one of the criticisms about this is isn't that just kind of fluffy? You know, isn't, you know, school academic achievement, but the idea that it's a twofer, <laughs> that's what my friend Roger says, that while promoting their social and emotional skills, you're also increasing their academic achievement. Um, and so that was really important. One of the things about what you just said is like, you, you think about the control group, um, that's a group that didn't mm -hmm. get any social and emotional. There are a lot of really good teachers in there, and they're probably doing some pretty wonderful things in their classroom. So there's something about those social and emotional programs where it was deliberate and explicit. So there's mm -hmm. something about that that is kind of a theme for tonight. It's, it's, it's good to be a good person as a, as a teacher or a parent, but there's something about knowing about the mechanisms for teaching this stuff and doing something that's deliberate. Yeah, and in fact, you, it's good you bring that up because one of the things that they found is they said, what are the characteristics of these programs? And they had an acronym they call SAFE. It had to be sequenced, it had to be active, it had to be focused and explicit. So you actually had to intentionally teach some of these skills. So for example, one of the really critical skills in, emo in emotions is developing emotion understanding and reading facial mm. expressions. So young children need to know to identify different facial expressions and how that depicts how you feel a of the way you do and understand that. And they need explicit instruction and knowing like, well, what does that person's face look like? And why do you think they're feeling that way? And what would be, have you ever felt that way? And what would your face look like? Lots of intentional instruction in that regard. And do they actually learn then how to read a person's emotion? 
Yes, and they learn uh, how to read another person's emotions and how to read their own emotions yeah. as well, and how to know why they feel the way they do and in which situations, and the idea that all feelings are okay, but not all behaviors. Because mm -hmm. I think that's a really important message that all feelings are okay. You know, we all have a range of feelings. It isn't just about being happy, um, but we have to take that into account. So what are things that we do where we're actually not teaching them how to name emotions? Because there are a lot of people out there. I'm an interviewer. I, I interview a lot of people who I can't ask, how do you feel about that? Because I get a blank, mm -hmm. uh, absolutely a blank face. It's really hard for many adults to name an emotion, a friend of mine said the other day, I went to a therapist and I found out I have two emotions. <laughs> I only have two. He had no idea what he had two words for emotions. Wow. So what are things that we do to keep them from learning it or more positively, what can we do to help them learn it? Yeah, you know, I think there's lots of ways that we we communicate that it's not good to talk about feelings. Mm -hmm. I think there's lots of things like, oh, I don't want to hear about how you're feeling, just like take it to yourself. Um, you know, there's lots of things, and I'm sure all of you would have some great examples of what people do to stuff the feelings, because they know they come out in other ways then. Um, but there's lots of things we can do early on. I mean, I, I actually think, um, well, not me, I think. The research says, because um, that's really where, where I live. Um, uh, Cal Izzard, who is kind of the grandfather of emotion research, emotional development research, talks about the ages of three to five being this important um, sensitive period for emotion induction techniques. It's right when children begin making the connection between how you feel and how you think mm -hmm. and how you behave and how um, that's right at the time where parents really could spend a lot of time thinking about talking about emotions, thinking about well, how, how do you think, you know, reading the stories and pointing out how do you think that person's feeling um, playing different puppet, you know, puppets and trying to figure out, mm -hmm. can you figure out someone's emotions from how they're behaving? And, um, you know, so really lots of opportunities to, for play and, and ch children love it, you know, and looking at their own faces, yeah. And again, why is that important? Well, because it really helps them develop an understanding of their own emotions and other emotions. So then those are precursors to be able to have emotional regulation and being able to identify emotions and think about, you know, when I'm feeling this way, I behave that way. Is that the best situation? Maybe I shouldn't be um, behaving, letting my emotions get the best of me. I don't know if any of you have ever um, let your emotions get the best of you. <laughs> I don't know, driving, I don't know, all those things. You know, think about it. Our, you know, and the idea of really understanding Here's an emotion arising in me. I, I feel that emotion. Um, I'm getting angry. I don't really want to feel angry. Why am I doing that? How can I help myself? How could I reappraise the situation and think of it another way so I won't have that angry emotion, maybe have a more compassionate interpretation? So there's, yeah. we need to sort of learn those. But there, and it's interesting because that's what we talk about teach and learn and cultivate. Um, because I think there are, especially where emotions is concerned, we really need exp some explicit um, instruction of how to do some of that. Mm -hmm. I have this, um, my son bought me this flip, little flip chart, so it's about this big, and it's just, you flip it over and it has different emotions written on it. Uh, different words, like a little happy face, but sometimes not so happy, it might be um, quizzical or peckish or some, you know. And I find it really interesting throughout the day when I'm working, I'm feeling something, and I'm not sure what it is, but I'm feeling agitated, and I actually flip through the chart and find the word that matches the way I'm feeling, kind of sits in front of me, and it actually helps, I think, because of what you're saying. Somehow I've identified what I'm feeling, and I can just, you know, just feel it. Right, and so. it's important to have, to develop a, something we call a large corpus of emotional wor words, of really developing um, a large number of emotion words, because we have a number of different emotions. Um, the other thing, I just wanted to, so I don't, um, one of the other, so I had three recent innovations. So the idea that this can be taught, cultivated, and actually improve academic achievement. The second thing is that it's sticky or let's use the social and emotional fitness metaphor that there's muscle memory. <laughs> and, um, and I was just Googling that, right? And the idea that you're, you repeat uh, an exercise over and over again and learn it, and when you go back, your muscle remembers that. So in the same way that social and emotional, that you know, physical fitness, that social and emotional fitness can do the same. So the research is very limited. I have to say that the stickiness of how do we know that those, if you work on those skills early on, they really sort of stick later. 
But there is one study um, by David Hawkins, and he and colleagues, actually just in um, Seattle, they're at University of Washington, they, took a, 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 they did a study of children who, um, in their elementary school years, got a social and emotional learning program that involved parents, actually, it involved parents and teachers, and uh, did this in el the elementary school. And they had control groups, so you have to say control groups are always important because otherwise you don't know if it's a, the program or something or just about development. And they followed these, these children up until they were 24 and 27 years of age. And what they found was really interesting because what they found was that these students who had the social and emotional learning exposure in elementary school when they were just young children, at 24 and 27, they had higher educational attainment, a larger proportion went on to post-secondary. They, they made more money. They actually had higher socioeconomic status, so higher educational and economic attainment. They also had fewer mental health problems just by having in childhood this program that focused on helping them learn these skills. So it's sticky is the second one. So sticky. And then the third one, and this is kind of a cool area actually, is the advances in neuroscience. What we know, I heard a statistic, I'd love to know if anybody knows the, where, the origin of it, is that 90% of what we know about the brain was learned in the past decade. And this idea that we now can look at how you can change the brain, that there's neuroplasticity, that these ideas of how cognitions and emotions and how the brain lights up, we are now start really understanding some of the underlying mechanisms, like things like mirror neurons. How many have ever heard of these mirror neurons? You know, this idea that when you see someone else, it's sort of like the empathy neuron. When you see someone else in pain, that you, it's like you experiencing that pain as well. Um, so we now know so much more about the neuro. It's still in this very early stages, I have to say, because I don't want to make it seem like we know more. But I think that idea of the neuroplasticity. And we're going to come back to that later, about how we can use that in, in our interactions with children. Um, you've been talking about some of the research, and I, I think what I've heard mostly is that there's a lot of research in, in school settings. Is there much research in the area of parents using and grandparents and family using this, these kinds of strategies with children? You know, again, um, no. <laughs> there's not a lot. I think for really young children, I think there are many more, uh, there's re many, much more research aimed at the early years, I think, because of knowing the sort of effects of uh, parenting practices on later development and the idea of helping parents develop more positive parenting practices. Mm -hmm. I think there's been much more research attention and actually um, application. If you think of the Tolaris or mm -hmm. you think of these other places that really help focus on um, helping parents and caregivers know about emotional development in children and what they can do and Lots of examples um, of what, as I was mentioning before, using opportunities um, to talk about emotions mm -hmm. and talk about feelings and why certain things make us feel the way we do. But the other parts, uh, uh, older, not so much, I think. So a lot of that we're just sort of extrapolating from what we're learning in sc schools and in other settings, but I guess that research is evolving. Although it, I would say, um, although this isn't so much the research, at the, it's the parents of the early adolescents. Um, if anyone's ever gone to a bookstore and saw the books there about mm. early adolescence, it's like, you know, living with the monster and, you know, taming Bad the... Stuff. Yeah, it's all really, yeah. Yeah. Um, all right, so let's now start to dig into those areas that you've talked about and, and so that we can all leave here tonight mm -hmm. with a few more strategies. Yes. Um, one of the questions is, can you, can you actually teach a child to be kind? That's a really good question, you know, um, and it's one I've actually been, you know, trying to answer for many years, this idea of can you teach kindness or compassion or empathy? Um, and the answer is yes, you mm -hmm. can. And there are ways in which you could provide children with experiences that help develop their understanding of others' emotions. So one of the um, foundations for empathy or compassion or being kind is really understanding others' feelings first. And so that's why when I talk about how important it is to identify facial expressions and try and understand why people might feel the way they do is actually foundational to having empathy. And empathy really is defined as um, being able to experience the feeling of another person. There's two dimensions, a cognitive, perspective taking, how might that person be feeling versus having the actual feeling. But that idea of um, 
really helping children develop those, uh, learn those early skills that are the precursors for being empathic and compassionate um, are critical. And, and I think there's, there's different ways that you can, um, you know, modeling is everything, you know, because kids do what we do, not what mm. we say. And so much of modeling caring behavior and having opportunities. If I had to say if there's three, I mean, I have many kind of suggestions. What, what are things that parents can do to promote empathy in their children? I would say how important it is to talk about um, the good feelings that come when you help someone else or when you feel, say, oh, I really noticed you're sad right now or um, and what you can do to help other people. Um, Actually, I just t tell you about a story that was uh, I loved. Uh, I don't know if any of my, Griffin's early childhood educators are here, but there was a group at a uh, Griffin, um, who's now 15, was at um, a daycare downtown. And one day I uh, came in to pick him up. He must have been three and a half. Mm. And he had, um, they took me aside and said, Kim, Griffin scratched one of his friends. And I said, oh, God. Oh, just of course you study empathy like don't you feel a bit <laughs> embarrassed there and then also I didn't cut his nails like really and it's so, all your fault I know it is mom you know actually I'll talk about moms in the, in the next bit but um, and they said no but everything's fine you don't have to deal with it because what they did is the perfect example of what you can do in practice is that Griffin had accidentally maybe on purpose scratched a friend in the face and so they talked with him. And instead of just saying, now say you're sorry, you know, and just say you're sorry now, and now go in the timeout. Instead, what they did is they, they had Griffin has asked his friend, what would you like to help you feel better? And the fr they said, would you like a cold washcloth on your face where you have the scratch? And so Griffin then sat with his friend holding up the cold washcloth for him. You know, so helped him do a restorative practice to help restore the relationship to bring it back rather than the forced mm -hmm. I sorry. So I think, I'm sorry, I think that um, it's so important to model it and to give kids lots of opportunities and realize that just one time telling them is not going to stick. You need repeated exposure in lots of different ways, both in the heat of the moment, but sometimes you need to do things beforehand and getting kids to think about why they behave the way we do. And um, the other thing I really want to emphasize what is so critical is to ask, use an inductive approach rather than say, you did this wrong, you weren't thinking, you're such a bad kid, now go over there, instead of saying, why? I really need to understand, maybe not in the heat of the moment, why do you think that happened? Why do you think you did that right then? What would be, and then, what would be a way to, to handle it next time? You know, and thinking about how were you feeling, how do you think the other person was feeling? At what age can you start doing uh, that? I think early, very early, starting, you know, I want to say two, three. I mean, mm -hmm. the other thing, and you'll see later on, I think we underestimate kids mm -hmm. all the time. I think they can benefit from things like that. Yeah, I think what I'm hearing in that story is an attitude, a piece that's about attitude, mm -hmm. that um, you know, we're trying to help our children. And if we thought that it would help uh, Griffin in his future world if we punished him, instead of did, mm -hmm. doing that, we would have punished him. But someone in there had a different attitude about how, how you teach a child empathy. So that's a big piece of this. Well, and it's leading with empathy yourself, mm. you know, because I think that's a whole other p component of, um, you know, sometimes it's hard as a parent, as a teacher, to uh, really have a lot of empathy for kids you feel are really misbehaving and things like that. So mm -hmm. you really is trying to think of what would be an empathic interpretation of that behavior. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and to, to actually be deliberate about that question mm -hmm. to yourself, yeah. Um, one of the other things is just to, to, you said to me, I think maybe even today, that stress is contagious, and I thought that was an interesting idea. Oh, yeah, idea. so, um, you know, uh, there's a, in sociology, there's this personality stress contagion model where, in fact, um, our own stress actually can, can sort of filter down to the environment. And there's been some research in elementary school classrooms where they find that teachers who are really stressed, who in fact have um, fewer resources in the classroom, who feel they aren't respected by their colleagues, actually the students in their classroom have higher rates of internalizing and externalizing disorders, which means mental health problems. That stresses me out. I know. <laughs> it totally is. And I have to say, you know, 
kids are empathic to their parents. I think children are so in tune with how we feel and what our faces look like and stuff. And they pick up our stress. And I think they just, like the hurriedness, you know. So in the middle years development instrument, one of the questions is when we ask the kids what they wish to be doing. When we ask them what, they, what were the barriers to them um, from not doing what they wish to be doing, you know what their number one reason was and across all these districts? I'm too busy. Well, they have five pieces of technology to <laughs> orchestrate. <laughs> they are. Exactly. That's very interesting. So they, there's a kind of hurriedness in our society yeah. about, like, I'm too busy, and we yeah. have to get here right away, and you have to yeah. do this. And so I think. Uh, so I, this idea that somehow if we're stressed out that our children may have some really pretty serious you know, problems about that. We all get stressed out. Mm -hmm. And as you've just pointed out, we live in a really busy world. So I, I can't, we can't leave it at that <laughs> because that's just too stressful. How, yes. uh, uh, that's reality. So how can we live our lives, be sometimes stressed out and, and not damage our children? Right, and I think um, the, so there's a couple of things here. I think one thing is that all stress is not bad. In fact, you know, like right now, I'm up here speaking in front of this, and a little bit of stress is good. It helps, you know, optimize performance and makes you, you know, more alert. But there's a, we call it like a U-shaped curve, you know, with a no stress, you know, you need a, a certain level, but then it sort of peters off where then you really have, it interferes with everything. So um, what the research is really saying now um, is that uh, parents and teachers need to have um, self-care, that we need mm. actually to help ourselves, and we need to find ways to de-stress ourselves and find ways to be, have self-compassion and our own tools for managing stress. So there's a couple of things. One is um, Christine Neff, who's written a book on self-compassion, and talks about these ideas of we have to learn to be compassionate for ourselves and practice self-compassion. And I just was reading an article where she was talking about, um, I don't know if any of you guys have ever had a really bad day you know, at work. And, and really, I think so much of us, we beat ourselves up. We come back and go, oh, I should have done that. And I didn't get all this done today. And you come home and you think, uh, and, and Christine Neff talks about, like, instead of just sitting there going, oh, God, I'm just, what a loser, you know? You think about if you had your best friend sitting there and your best friend was mm. saying those words. And you wouldn't say, yeah, you're right. <laughs> you would say, oh, no, there's so many wonderful things about mm -hmm. you. And there's all this great stuff. So we really need to practice that self-compassion. I'm just thinking if, you, if I wasn't going to do it for myself, that is, take the time to take care of myself, I'd probably take care of myself for the reason you just pointed out, for my children. Yes. So that's a, that's a good reason to take care of ourselves. Exactly. That yeah, you really need to it. do it. Yeah. for children. And I think now we're learning a, whole, um, a number of other techniques of how important it is to help, uh, you know, mindfulness practices are another one, practicing what do you mean yoga. By that? Um, mindfulness, how many of you ever heard of mindfulness? Oh yeah, look at this. If I would have been here five years ago, no one would have raised their hands, or maybe three of you would have. Um, mindfulness is really, um, you know, sort of, it, it has a number of different term, you know, um, meanings. But the way I refer to it is really taking the, um, definition of John Kabat-Zinn, which is the idea of paying attention in the present moment non-judgmentally. And the idea of practice, you could do mindfulness walking, you could be mindful while you're washing the dishes. And the idea is to really practice being in the present moment in a way that's not, that thoughts come into your mind instead of thinking, I have these five, the shopping list, to just say, let me just feel the water on my hands and just be in the present moment. And, and I would actually argue how important it is for us to actually be mindful in our conversations with our children and being present with them and really listening mm. to them. Isn't there some research about that with teachers? Yes, with the SMART program. Yes, yeah, so we have a program in which we've been doing research called SMART in Education, Stress Management and Resilience Training, which is a program that's eight week. It's kind of based on John Kabat-Zinn's mindfulness-based stress reduction, which I'm not gonna go into details about, but it's an eight week course. It teaches mindfulness, gives you certain practices in which you could help reduce your stress, um, foster well-being. And we have a program we've been doing for teachers now that's had very positive uh, benefits for teachers in a number of ways. Um, rigorous studies, controlled, you know, and finding reduced stress and um, burnout, increased job satisfaction, mm -hmm. and even more compassion for students. 
Oh, so you don't know yet how the students have reacted to that? No, we're just now, I mean, that's the other thing. What's the trickle-down effect? Yes. I mean, we're hoping, thinking of that stress contagion, contagion model of teachers' stress can leak out into the classroom, we're now going to find out if teachers become better able to manage their stress and have higher well-being, does that leak out mm -hmm. into the classroom as well? It's pretty hard, isn't it, in our day and age to, to be able to do that, to be mm -hmm. able to stop and slow down. But I think you're making a pretty compelling argument for chilling out, figuring out yes. a way to take care of yourself. Yeah. Um, one of the other things that, that uh, you talk, you said you were going to get back to a minute ago was this whole idea of mothers and nurturance and the, the value of father and mother nurturance for children. Well, um, I just read a recent study, it's going to be published in Science actually, that found that um, mothers are the key. <laughs> they did a study of children in high poverty and found that those children in high poverty that who had mothers though that were nurturant and sensitive to the child's behavior didn't ha suffer the ill effects of poverty mm. that you would see more detrimental mm. outcomes. There was something about that important uh, sensitivity and I mean I have to say being present and listening and and um, really helping your child. So, so much of a focus has been on fixing a child, and I, what I'm hearing you say is it's really about settling ourselves down so we can be present yes. for that child. Yeah. Um, um, one of the other things is that, that there's, there's this trend out there, I did a documentary about it, that, that is, um, it's a hyper-parenting trend. And parents do it out of love. They do it because they want to help their children be successful. And, they, and we, as parents, um, overdo. We do everything for our children, and we plan their life for them. And we, when they're born, we get them ready to go to university. But it's all out of love. Mm -hmm. um, where does that fit in, in developing social and emotional learning, de social development, social and emotional competencies? Well, what we know is that, um, so it's interesting, you know, being a parent, I, I have to say, you know, I thought, you know, here I went and did a master's and PhD in child development, and then I had children and I knew nothing. <laughs> you know, I have to say, it taught me so much having my own kids. In fact, you know, every day I'm learning new things. And um, the thing uh, for me, what's so interesting is the hyper parenting and being a parent, you really want to protect mm -hmm. your children. Um, from, you know, I want to put them in the plastic bubble, I want to protect them, I want to do things for them. And yet the research now is coming out that you really have to give them opportunities for doing. And that you really have to support them learning by doing and, and do, um, uh, realize that actually one study, this uh, going back to Clancy Blair's research on executive functions, that looking at parents who, did, who either had very punitive discipline approaches or parents who did everything for their children, their children had um, sort of lower levels of these executive functions, this ability to manage their emotions, an ability to have self-control. So the message is? Is really you have to provide opportunities in a sensitive in a parenting way for your children to do and play with them and interact with them and and realize that that's that you have to have those opportunities to do things together mm -hmm. and not to do everything for, for them. them. You're, you're mentioning the prefrontal cortex and the you know self-regulation all those words so let's start to break that down a little bit. Um, you've, you Tell us more about what we know uh, about how we can actually affect the development of the brain. Well how many have heard that term self-regulation? Self-control, wow. Oh, wow. So that's wow. really a growing terminology. Yeah. And we now know. That's amazing. It, it is. I'm so impressed. You guys are so highly educated <laughs> audience here. Um, but the idea is what we know now that this idea of self-control or self-regulation, I talked about the prefrontal cortex. Um, and actually, what we know from brain development is that we have this amygdala that's kind of in the center brain, that's kind of an older part that's our fight or flight immediate response, you know, that. Um, you know, it's going to help protect us or we're going to flee. That's you what know, happens so in traffic. Survival, yeah, exactly. And that, um, but one of the later parts of the brain that developed is the prefrontal cortex, which really was about planning and it's our, it's our executive functions, working memory, how we plan. decision-making, good decision-making for teenagers, for kids. So. Exactly, and that develops. And we now know that you can strengthen that, um, that that is something that you can help cultivate through uh, activity and help promote. Um, there is one study, actually I just have to tell you this kind of cool recent study um, by Terry Moffitt and colleagues. Uh, they Last year it was published Proceedings of National Academy of Sciences and they followed a thousand children from birth to 32 years of age um, in New Zealand. And what they found, the single best predictor of children's, of uh, adulthood, 
32 years of age, like how you managed your finances, what kind of mental, criminal offending, mental health problems, the single best predictor of a whole range of things was self-control early on. So it was really quite a fascinating. Okay, so you're, you're going to tell us about how we can enhance self-control in our children. But first, you're going to show us a video. Yes. Set it up. So, okay, so um, this is a video. Uh, so one of the first people, well, I, I don't know, early on who was studying this idea of self-control was uh, Walter Michel. He's at uh, Stanford University. And he began doing some uh, studies in the 1970s, 1972, uh, in a preschool at Stanford about um, resistance to temptation or the marshmallow test. You guys, oh, see, all know there. You get to see it again. And so um, what he did is he kind of, you know, was just really interested. This experiment had been done in other places. And what he did is he uh, put four children, four ages four to six, and here they have a couple of younger kids, in a, an experiment and said, here's a marshmallow. Actually, there were Oreo cookies. You got to choose. I think pretzel sticks, Oreos, or marshmallows. Like, of course, which you like the most. And then he would say, here's the, you know, the experimenter would say, here's a marshmallow. If you could sit in here and not, you know, don't move, just sit there and not eat the marshmallow, I think it was up to 15 minutes, Oof. which is excruciating, um, you will get two marshmallows. And uh, here's- And then he saw what happened. We'll you'll see, see what, what happens. happens. You'll see what happens. Okay, sit in that chair. All right, here's the deal. Marshmallow, for you. You can either wait, and I'll give you another one if you wait, or you can eat it now. When I come back, I'll give you two, another one, so then you'll have two. But stay in here and stay in the chair till I come back, okay? okay. All right. I'm gonna go do something and then I'll come back. It smells yummy. Uh, it smells really I can tell you which kid I would have been in there for sure. So, so the children who were able to not eat the marshmallow, tell us again what. So, um, so it was a, looking at self-control. It was they called it resistance to temptation. And just interestingly, what happened is, is Walter Michelle, because 
his children were classmates in the same daycare as these kids. He was able to actually follow them up past high school. And uh, just through kind of, it, it's interesting how the study emerged because just through conversations, he started quickly seeing that some of the children as, as teenagers and graduating high school, first they found that those children, only um, about 30% of children could wait the whole 15 minutes. And they found that those children who could wait, um, when they took the SATs, a, a college entrance exam, they had um, their point, they had 200 points higher mm. than the children who could not wait. Okay, so this really matters. So we really yes. need to know how can we help children develop this characteristic. Go ahead, tell yes. us. <laughs> so what's so interesting now that we know, and really it's again the innovation in, in the brain and really knowing about this prefrontal cortex, is that you can train the brain, that you can actually provide children with intentional, explicit activities that help develop their self-regulation and self-control. Okay, we're not talking about flashcards. No, 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 and uh, no, well, we're just, just uh, doing. Just um, well, there's a couple of things. One, I do want to mention, we actually, in our midst, we're very fortunate, and, and actually, I have to say something about British Columbia. British Columbia and what is happening here, the innovations both in the research world and the educational world are phenomenal. And in fact, we're leading the world in many ways. In, in terms social of, and emotional learning. In social and emotional learning. And I think um, one of the things I was going to say, so one of the um, sort of world-renowned cognitive developmental neuroscientist is here, Adele Diamond, who has done research looking at the way that you could train the brain. And she talks about a program called Tools of the Mind which is a preschool program that helps um, develop these self-regulation strategies through things like um, children having to wait. So if children are reading a story to each other, and you know how children, you give them a book and they both want to read and they both want to look at the pictures to actually help develop those self-control skills, one will get the lips that says, now you get to read the story, and one will get an, a picture of an ear. And so they know I have to sit here and listen. So they need to be given lots of opportunities to have to wait, to say, okay, let's, but it's scaffolding. So it's a structure. And then their brain actually starts to? Well, giving the idea that, you know, a lot of people think it's still developing, these core skills are, mm -hmm. it's still so young, but that you can actually give children opportunities. But again, it's, it's gotta be repeated. It's, it's gotta be across context. It has to have application of having them learn these. And we know uh, also another program in which I'm doing research, the Mind Up program, that helps uh, develop children's uh, mind, uses mindfulness and positive psychology social and emotional learning and neuroscience that there's lots of activities where children have to learn to pay attention in the present and do something I've talked about mindful they have to do mindful listening or they have to listen for a sound and and listen just for if they're listening to a music please let's just listen for the violin or let's go outside and see if we could hear any crickets um, all of those kinds of activities again to help develop that um, self-regulation it seems there probably was a time when children did a lot more of that just sitting outside and looking at the grass I mean I spent hours just you know mm. looking at the prickle bush and trying to figure it out I remember that so wow. these days we don't have that kind of time just to sit and, and focus on something. So well, you have to be deliberate with children. Deliberate and intentional. And I think, you know, how do things like watching TV or being on the computer develop those skills versus actually having to do an intentional activity that's focused? So you think about a parent then, and just on that very point about attention, giving your children opportunities just to pay attention, what are some things that they might do? In terms of um, some of the aspects of those programs you talked about that you could apply. At well, home. you certainly could do things like when you're reading a child a story and having them pay attention and really listen mm -hmm. to different things. Um, there is lots of opportunities to practice these sort of attention exercises of of both tasting. So, for example, here's a perfect one. You know. Um, the marshmallow test. Well, think about if you had, um, we do this mindful tasting, you know, let's, let's have a, 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 a piece of candy or marshmallow, but let's start by smelling it. Let's um, also sort mm. of see how it feels and really go through those. And actually, you know, it's interesting because I think that if you think about being present, um, has anyone ever taken a walk with a two-year-old mm. of how much they notice they do. And having the opportunities instead of hurrying them along really mm -hmm be in the present and here and now. And so just to make the connection again, what you're saying is that's actually shaping the brain. It's yes. actually physically shaping the brain in a way that that part of the brain that they'll need to make decisions in a complex world to manage themselves in, 
or is being developed. Mm -hmm. Another uh, aspect of the, these programs is gratitude. And how is that connected? Right. Interestingly, so in the past uh, decade, there really has been a focus again from that notion of ill being to well being. And um, we now know from the science that um, we can learn to promote our own happiness. And I talked about this idea that um, actually Marty Seligman and Mike Cheeks at Mihai have talked about this positive psychology. So what we know with gratitude, and it's just one way in which we can promote our happiness, is by practicing being thankful for um, certain things, that you having those opportunities to practice gratitude. There's a recent study um, that actually came out that says uh, writing gratitude letters. You know, Thanksgiving is coming up, and some of you who are teachers or parents might be practicing gratitude. And the research really says uh, in the study where they had gratitude letters, they actually took a group, let's say this whole group here, and they randomly, they had all of you fill out measures on happiness and well-being and depression and a whole range of other things. And then half of you during the second week had to write a gratitude letter. Pick someone in your life you want to thank, write out a letter of what you're thankful for. And then third week, do the same thing. And the fourth week, do the same thing. And this other group was not doing anything. And they assessed them again. And the group that just took those, wrote those three gratitude letters, you know, once a week, and they didn't even mail them. I think they mailed them at the end of the study, um, was happier and had fewer, less depression. And you said that with children? It. Is that what there, you Well, with children, it's, uh, there's, only ver there's very few research, research studies looking at gratitude interventions. There's one by Jeffrey Froh that used middle school students that did this opportunity of practicing gratitude. Um, but we're beginning to understand the role. But, but you should ask me, well, why do you think? OK, just a sec. Yeah. But why do you think? <laughs> there you go. <laughs> Well, let's see. I wasn't really prepared for that question. <laughs> um, the idea of, you know, I think, again, that that idea, we get in this rut of ruminating and thinking about all that is wrong and all that's going wrong. And gratitude helps us get out of that tunnel that we get into when we're thinking of everything that's wrong with ourselves and opens us up to start thinking about others and thinking about, you know, I might not be where I am today if I hadn't had that person in my life or that teacher who said that amazing mm -hmm. thing to me when I was, I think you even have a story about that, don't you? About what? A oh, teacher. yes, yes. Yes, I do. It's a very boring story. <laughs> <It's not. laughs> no, but but you do remember, we all remember the one time, time, the one teacher, I mean, something. all the years of school, and one teacher says one thing. In my case, he, a teacher in grade 11 said, yeah, you can write. And no one had ever said that to me before. And from the minute he said that, I thought, I am going to be a writer now <laughs> because this one teacher. So yeah, we all and, have that. And practicing that gratitude that takes us out of our sort of shell of self-absorption. Mm -hmm. Well, it's interesting because Oprah, of course, has the gratitude journal thing mm -hmm. that she was telling um, men and women across uh, all of North America to do gratitude journals. But what you're saying is that this is something we could actually be deliberately doing with our children mm -hmm. is encouraging even stopping for a moment and being grateful or every day thinking about what, I guess that's what uh, actually, when I used to kneel down and pray at night, I think that's probably what I was being encouraged <laughs> what to you're do. thankful yeah. for. Although, um, interestingly enough, the research on gratitude says too much can be do, do harm. So if you start getting into a thing, at least mm -hmm. with adults, finding out if they're doing gratitude journals f five days a week, that it actually can kind of backfire and make you like, oh, I'm tired of thanking everything. So you shouldn't be a hyper parent <laughs> when it comes to this stuff either. <laughs> Just, right. Yeah, watch exactly. your child. And, and of course, there's the temperament. As I watched that piece, uh, those children, I, I was struck too by a different temperament comes into yeah. this as well. So it's not as simple as there's one size fits all. Right, that's exactly. really what you're saying, don't do it. Um, one of the other uh, larger bullet points, we talked about the changing brain and what we can all do to help children uh, develop that prefrontal cortex. Um, another thing is it's it, what you call it's good to be good. Mm -hmm. I, I love this. You know, I, I mean, the thing is, is that I've, I've really spent my career looking for the good in children, trying to figure out where, how do we create the context and the conditions in which to promote uh, caring for others and empathy. Um, and empathy is not enough. I do want to say 
empathy is not enough because you could feel for someone else but not move to action. And compassion is really what we want to cultivate. Compassion is where you feel for someone and then it makes you want to do something and move to action. So that's mm. really the thing. And, and um, what's so interesting in the recent research is we're actually finding that um, some of the recent stuff is uh, children are born, uh, well, not born. Well, actually, they, some people say that uh, the reactive newborn cry. I don't know if you've ever seen this, where you place a, a crying infant next to another crying uh, next to another infant, and the other infant starts crying. They say that's sort of the the seed of empathy. But I think this idea of um, some of the research. So um, I think we're going to show yeah. something. I'm going to just set it up a bit. We have a couple of videos here. Um, a colleague of mine, well, uh, who I met through some of this shared research, has been studying um, the roots of human altruism and this idea, are we born altruistic? In fact, is the reason our species have survived is because we help each other, because we become engaged in trying to understand someone's pain or suffering or um, problems and try and help them. And they started thinking about when does this whole idea of altruism, doing something for someone else with no expectation of reward, that's the true definition mm -hmm. of altruism, when does it emerge? So Felix Wernicken, and, uh, who's now at Harvard University, and Michael Tomasello, when they were both at the Max Planck Institute for Evolutionary Psychology, set up a series of experiments with 18-month-olds. And they wanted to say, um, would But we these, can see. Are we going to see? Yeah. OK. Will they help? Yeah. <laughs> Wow. So what are we seeing there? What, what are so, you seeing? It's so fascinating. So first of all, um, you know, they found this in multiple experiments. And the article, uh, the research studies published in the journal Science, and they've replicated it. In fact, it's been replicated in the US as well. A number of different situations where they had the non-kin, no, they even, you know, controlled by where the, the child there was no expectation of them helping versus um, there, uh, there um, was this kind of situation where the child had to kind of figure out the situation. And the mother did nothing, right? She just No. Uh, well, it's interesting because it goes back to that learning by doing. And mm. the idea that the parent didn't say, you know, don't. Go get the pig. Go get the pig. Yeah. Or, d or the parent didn't, say, didn't go and do it yeah, themselves, right? right? right, right, right Instead right. of having the child do it. So that was an important lesson. But what was happening, I first want to make one really important point. Now think of, all of you think about that 18-month-old. That child had to look at the situation, figure out what the problem was, what the solution was, and then how to physically enact solving it. Think of the complexity, the perspective taking, and all the different levels, if you broke down all their thinking, we underestimate children and their capabilities. Because I think we don't put them, you know, so that to me was mm. one thing that really shows. Now, what's fascinating is, is that they repeat, these 18 month olds repeatedly helped in these situations. And what the research says, uh, we talk about pro-social behavior, helping others, sharing, cooperating. And we often think that this thing sort of start where you don't know anything, and then it develops all and across we teach childhood. Them. Mm -hmm. We teach them, and you become, you know, as you understand other people's points of view, you're more likely to help. The research actually shows that children, that their pro-social behavior, things like this altruism, actually decrease across the elementary school years. Children become less likely to help others, less likely to share. And, um, and actually, uh, Felix and Michael Tomasello, they make an argument that we get socialized out of it. So in other words, we, we don't have to teach them how to be like that. We just have to not knock it out of them. 
-hmm. How do we knock it out of them? Well, you know, I think about, I mean, just, uh, I think not, so first of all, I don't think it's inevitable. I think there's lots of places, classrooms, places where you see teachers who cultivate or parents who cultivate this. We all help each other. We all work together. Um, oh, here, and I give you one, one parenting tip. Actually, it's so fascinating. Research on, do you pay your children to do household chores? Do you want to know what it says? Um, no. Research says that actually when you pay children to do household chores, it undermines their empathy and caring for others. So anyways, I think what we have to do Wait is... Wait a second, I'll just stay with that for a sec. Why does it do that? Well, think about it because all of a sudden, um, okay, uh, part of being in family is all working together as a, us all being with each other. You know, why should it just be the parents doing and the kids like expecting like, okay, I'm gonna make my bed, where's my five dollars? Mm -hmm. um, instead of like we all are together and that idea of thinking about how we all are together mm -hmm. and we all play a role in this family in this way of being with each other. So and we, we reduce the likelihood of this happening if we started paying and, yeah, and actually, rewarding. It, actually, very interesting. Another uh, really interesting study by Felix and Michael, they've been doing lots of stuff, is how extrinsic rewards undermine altruistic tendencies in two and a half year olds. And they did a study where they had a, this large group of two and a half year olds, um, and they asked them to do something like that. And they had one group that they gave a toy prize to, one group when the child did something, they said, thank you, just thank you very much. And one group that said nothing. The group that got the prize stopped helping, the extrinsic reward. The kids who got thank you and the kids who got nothing continued. I mean, even in that situation, you didn't see any verbal like, good job, or anything. Felix like kind of went, mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> It was very sweet. Yeah, very sweet. sweet. <laughs> very sweet. But I think. Um, so the takeaway message from that is? is that we have to create um, and support context that allow this kind of altruistic, helpful behavior Just that kids help, you know, that they, they want to help. And, and you wonder how when they get into school, and I think not so much the early years, but all of a sudden we have all this grading practices and comparing everyone to everyone else and, you know, um, even things, I always say this, I say this in every talk I do, you know, don't do the um, have kids grade each other's and then have stand at the front of the room and have them all say each other's grades? No. You know, no. <laughs> again, it creates that situation. It's all, we're all in it for ourselves, you know, and the more that you could create that mm. um, idea of a collective um, that we're w working together. I think, in fact, some of the research I've done on the Roots of Empathy program, where the children work together to do things that benefit the baby, I'm not going to go into, and Roots of Empathy is about bringing a baby into the classroom, that we find that it significantly improves their pro-social behavior, um, whereas kids in the control group actually get worse throughout the year. Well, and you've done some fascinating research recently on volunteering. So we're talking about little children here, but this is... Yeah, so, um, oh yeah, so uh, it's volunteering. So it's interesting on, so first of all, it's good to be good with research on volunteering, on altruism shows that people who, who help others that the benefits for the person giving the help are greater than the person receiving the help hmm. in terms of physical benefits wow. and health benefits. And um, uh, last year, a colleague of mine who's been doing research on adolescent health and asthma and uh, different kinds of all of these things I'm not that familiar with, came to me and said, you know, Kim, I've read about this research on uh, the elderly called Experience Corps, where you have these hmm. senior citizens who go into elementary schools, it's in the States, and read books to children. And they, they haven't focused on the benefits for the children, they focused on the benefits for the elderly and found that the, these seniors who were going in and volunteering had all these health benefits. And so Edith Chen, my co-author, and one of her doc doctoral students, Hannah Shire, said, well, do you think there's benefits for adolescents who volunteer, health benefits? And I said, I have no idea. I didn't know of any research on that. So we did a study here in Vancouver where we took um, a grade 10, and a lot of the kids, you know, grade 10, around 14, 15, they have to do a course called Planning 10. And we went to a local high school in a lower socioeconomic area. And we said, could we do this research study, see if, in fact, there's any health benefits to adolescents volunteering? And so what we did is we wanted to see where there, um, 
do they benefit in terms of their, their uh, all sorts of health? So we went into the school, got 100, over 100 kids volunteer for the study. And then what we did is before the volunteering began, we took their blood. And some of you went, how do they give you, I was saying, how do they give you their blood? Um, if you give them money, they pretty much will. <laughs> There's the extrinsic <laughs> reward. $15. So we took, um, we, t we went in, we took their blood, we took their blood pressure, we took their body mass index, and then we randomly assigned 50 of them to go into, for the next 10 weeks, to go into local elementary schools and after school time and volunteer for about an hour and a half a week for 10 weeks. And then the other control group, the group that wasn't, they didn't get anything. Then we came back and we took their blood again. So here you had this 100 kids, took their blood, took all these health in, in, uh, indices, 50 volunteered, 50 didn't volunteer, came back and assessed them again. And what we found was fascinating, just, just that short intervention of you know, working with these little kids in the elementary school, which actually, by the way, probably benefited the little kids as well. Um, they, the kids who did the volunteering had lowered cholesterol, a lowered body mass index, and actually improved this uh, interleukin-6, which is a marker of um, risk for heart disease, in just that short amount of time. Um, I, we're, we have this under review at a journal right now, but, we're, but it really was fascinating that the health at the volunteering and trying to understand what is it about the volunteering that led to those health benefits. So you, yeah. But you can't make uh, that young person do that. Uh, can you? I mean, is it better if they want oh, to do that? Oh, it's interesting. You know, the research on um, this community service learning and is it, uh, if it's required versus volunteer, are there benefits? And it's interesting because um, what we know from the research is that even required community service <laughs> learning can have benefits mm -hmm. if there's an opportunity to make it meaningful and have time for reflection about how it fits within who they are as a person. If it's just kind of writing the hours down, no benefits. But or how was your day? Fine. Yeah, yeah exactly. As opposed to no. more que probing, more, probing questions, you well, mean? Well, and or? really figuring out um, them to think about what that um, experience was uh, having, having done that opportunity and help, you know, done yeah. that um, volunteering work. The other thing I want to just mention about our volunteering study, we intentionally focused on relationships. Yeah. We intentionally said we want to do a volunteering that's about relationships, that's about working with younger children. Um, of course, we have many more studies that do get the same benefits if you, if you volunteer to file, file um, books. Yes. <laughs> You know, yeah. um, and so we were we yeah. were really focused on that. Uh, you were going to talk about relationships, and then we're going to get to your questions. But before we do, a few times you've mentioned low socioeconomic status, poverty. Is this problems with social and emotional development uh, something that's um, only something we should be concerned about for kids who are in low socioeconomic situations? No. You know, I think it, what's so interesting, first of all, we need to focus on all children. But in the past several years, there's been a really focus on how do we promote resiliency among all children. And we often focus about children in poverty, but what we also know, um, Clyde Hertzman will talk about the idea of, of, of sort of middle um, levels of income and sort of this whole middle class and the problems that happen. But the other one that's most fascinating is some work by Sonia Luther. Um, and it's looking at risk and resiliency, and often we think at risk, you know, poverty and all those other kind of, you know, <coughs> problems. But actually, she started looking at children of affluence. And she has a great review article called um, The Culture of Affluence, The Psychological Costs of Material Wealth. And talking about this idea that children at the high end uh, actually have a lot of problems. And, and Mike Cheeks at Me High actually did this an interesting study where he looked at happiness and found an inverse relationship of happiness with how much money you had. So the happiest, the, uh, the unhappiest children were those from the highest social class. Hmm. So I think there's much more, and, but we're just beginning again. Yeah, we to need understand to. that. Um, so you want to talk about, say something about relationships, and then we need to, we'll, we'll speaking of relationships, <laughs> yes, get to your to questions. Talk. Well, I, I think I wanted to just, I just want to tell you, you know, I, as you could see, I really love research and sort of have these findings. And one of, you know, I always think about these kind of interesting findings. And one, it, it was one I'd love to do here. Um, it's the Lunch Buddy uh, study. 
And it was a study of, um, they took these really highly aggressive kids. What we know of children who have a lot of aggression or are rejected by their peer group early on have a host of problems when they get to be adults. They're more likely to drop out of school, uh, engage in substance abuse, and a number of other things. And so what they did was they said, let's do, um, the researchers, Tim Cavell and others, let's take this really intensive program for high aggressive, let's work with the teachers, let's work with the parents, let's give them like the Cadillac version of everything. But we want to do a randomized study, we want to ma make sure we have a control group. So we're going to have a control group, um, and we don't want them not to get anything, but we want something that's pretty innocuous. Let's see, well there's a, in, it was University of Alabama, I think. They said, well there's some kind of community engagement thing. Let's have, um, see if we can go to the university and get these undergrads to come and have lunch two times a week with these kids in the control group. So to sit in the lunchroom. To sit in the lunchroom. So they came in, sat in the lunchroom for half an hour, twice a week with the child in the control group, the other group of aggressive, so all aggressive kids, one group, the control group, getting this lunch buddy, you know, twice a week just over the period of several weeks. This group intensive, getting parents, doing all this stuff super expensive. Are you guessing where I'm going? <laughs> the kids who got the lunch buddy twice a week, no cost, actually improved more than the children who had. And actually, after a year, when they followed them up, the, the, the changes, the positive changing, decreased aggression, improved peer relationships sustained. Why do you think that is? I don't know. I mean, <laughs> they're doing research. They're trying to figure out what it was. They're trying to figure out, was there something about what? Well, they say, there's, there's a couple of things. One is, so here you're sitting in the lunch. Here's this, here you are, the second grader. Who no one really likes, because you're always starting fights. And here, all of a sudden, you're like sitting in the lunchroom with this really cool young uh, student, a yeah. college student, a, a male or a female who's talking with you at lunch. And so what that, so, so first of all, well maybe you're not so bad. Maybe you mm. really have something, you know. So it sort of improves their reputation. But also what would happen in those interchanges, you can't bring an adult to sit in the lunch room who's gonna be fun and engaging without becoming a magnet oh. for all the other kids. Mm. So all of a sudden, this person who's saying, you know, talk, this is your special person, but is also engaging with these other kids to make sure they, um, mm. in sort of approving you become of positive cool. behaviors. Hmm. Yeah. All right, questions. Fred, is you out there with the microphone? Oh, and John. Does anybody have any questions? We have one down here. Um, I was ready for me? Um, I've just loved your last point about kind of scaffolding the older with the younger, and um, we're doing some programs at our school on that, and I'm just wondering, have you seen some good research on how, I mean, we all know it's true, like if the older kids are teaching the younger kids social skills, that they learn them faster than from adults, but is there some good research out there on that? There is, um, yes, there is. I can't cite everything right now, even though I'm supposed to be a human Google. <laughs> I want to tell you right now. Um, yes, there is this whole idea of the um, cross-age um, mentoring has really received a lot of attention of having older children um, work with the younger children. I mean, the one, the study I just talked about that we've done with the volunteering of the older, the high school students working with the elementary school students has shown all of these health benefits, but there's a number of other studies really saying these cross-age buddies. And, and in fact, um, there's a really good recent review by Bruce Ellis and all that talks about adolescent risky behavior and ways to prevent it is by engaging, again, these um, older students with the younger ones because there's benefits for both. And in fact, it kind of reflects where we were in society years ago where you had these larger families and the older children help take care of the younger children. And the children. classrooms where they were young. I mean, that goes yes. back a long way, but. No, it's true. So there is, there is research. Maybe afterward I can, I'll, I can give you my card and you could, I'll send it to you. Hi. Hi. Um, I'm really interested in uh, helping adults repair any damage from not having mm -hmm. um, learned any of these social emotional skills as children. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering if there's any research or resources you can point me to uh, to learn more about if, if anybody's doing any work on, 
on what you can do with an adult to, to uh, continuing education, I guess. Right. You know, that's a really good question. I have to say, off the top of my head, I can't think of, I mean, I certainly could, I'm just thinking of a few things. Uh, certainly, um, this idea of, I mean, I, I have to say, the SMART in Education program, I talked about the stress management and resilience training, because it is about a turning inward and really understanding um, why we feel the way we do. And, and one of the things that happens so much is what we go on automatic pilot and sort of respond and don't understand maybe why we're having that, that reaction to a certain student or a certain person that is a, a, and, uh, bringing up things in us that we're not yet aware of and how we have mm -hmm. to really develop that self-awareness and say, you know, I'm giving this response. I don't like myself when I'm doing that, but I realize it comes from not having these um, earlier skills of when I was a child. And so it helps you deal with it in a way that is um, with self-compassion and understanding um, emotion. In fact, part of it is uses Paul Ekman's work on emotion identification and really being able to understand emotions and understand why we feel the way we do. Mm -hmm. And another part of the component is, this self, is the forgiveness both um, forgiving oneself, but for, for the idea of forgiving others. Um, you know, so I think that, I mean, I have to say, I think so much energy and probably a lot of healthcare costs are because people carry a lot of grudges. You know, a lot of um, uh, things that they, ha they still are angry about and, mm -hmm. and how important that is to. That's such important work you're doing because as Kim said earlier, those adults surrounding those children are, are creating an environment for the yeah, children now. Right. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. generations that are yes. from all of the work yeah. Mm -hmm. now. Yeah, and I know Dan Siegel has been here, and he says it's never too late. So mm -hmm. his books are certainly useful, Dan Siegel, yes, around this as well in terms of repair. Mm -hmm. Thank you for your question. Hi. Um, so it seems to me that, first of all, thanks so much, and it's really great to be here with your expertise. It seems that a lot of the social and emotional programs and all the learning that we can do, to some extent, is giving people skills to adapt to, an ex to a stressful world. Mm -hmm. um, and there's something that s strikes me as not comfortable with that. and. Um, I just wonder if you would comment or if you have any ideas about responding to that and, and what we can yeah. do. Yeah, I mean, I see, I mean, it's interesting because I think there are a lot of, there are some programs. I mean, I have to say, so a lot, um, so there's two things. One is a lot of the adolescent programs, in fact, they're just trying to, are always about preventing things. Like, let's prevent uh, drug and alcohol abuse. Let's prevent this kind of stuff. So there's a kind of a very much a, um, Band-aid approach and saying, well, might kids be drawn to those things to deal with the stress and and things like that, um, and even the childhood ones is sort of the um, emotions. But there are a number of programs that aren't so. So first of all, I have to say there are some programs that are sort of the idea that you know we have to deal with this world that's going out of control and we have to develop those skills to deal with the the bad world. And there are some ones that help you develop these stress management and things like that. But there are a number of programs that also help you um, develop caring for others and you know, focus on you know, the, the others. But, you bring, but sort of what I see is another point you're saying is, you know, is it sort of a Band-Aid approach to, you know, okay, we have this next generation, the world's getting out of control, we just have to prepare them to deal with this world, rather than say, how do we change this the world? How do we change the context so they won't have as much stresses and things? And, and I think, for example, I, I use this one is, um, does anyone else find it odd that our society has moved to having um, a work day of, of a large uh, working population of um, parents who work until 5, don't get home to 6, and a school day that still ends at 3 o'clock? Um, doesn't that seem a bit out of sorts? And, and what does that mean for how we um, help support families? And so this whole idea of what we could do as a society, and this is where policymakers and all of that comes into play of how do we support families and change structures so that we don't have this kind of hurriedness and franticness and having to deal with things like that. Is that kind of what, you know, so I think. It's a great we, start, and it sounds like there are people from the ministry. And like, imagine if the Ministry of Education said, actually, we can't do this unless 
people got off work early mm -hmm. or some, you know, something radical like that. Sounds good. Right. So, and I think it has to be uh, everyone, employers working together with, you know, but we really have to sort of say, why is, what's happening to our children now? Why are we seeing increased stress? Why are we seeing all these increases? And instead of saying, let's just fix those kids so they won't be as stressed. And, and I have to say, you know, in some places, if you've seen, ever seen Sir Ken Robinson's RSA thing about the increase of, of Ritalin across the U.S. from the West Coast to the East Coast. Um, and so there's a way that they're saying we're having increased pressures, but let's use medication as a way to deal with it. And anyway, so I totally yeah. agree. I, I wonder when I hear that question, though, it, I mean, it, if you think of a classroom as a microcosm, if, if each of the children in the classroom, you've seen this in research, are, are um, encouraged and learn to be more socially and emotionally aware of themselves and others, that that classroom setting, the whole thing settles down. It's, it's just a microcosm, but it's a world, and it's a sort of a settled world. Mm -hmm. And I think of the Dalai Lama himself saying that the way you're going to have more, less craziness in the world is by you know, one person at a time doing. So if you think of what Kim's talking about as being a movement almost, and you're saying, hurry up with this movement already. <laughs> like, let's stop trying to fix the kid. That's what we're saying. Mm -hmm. That's what the Dalai Lama Center is saying. Let's make this just universal. Let's make this as important as reading and writing, because then the more people who are doing that and are aware aren't going to make rules that are against families and against children. And I mean, I think mm -hmm. that's that's my little my little side. That's good. Who Within, has a microphone now? Mike. Within the context of the discussion and your, and your response to the last question, what are your thoughts on the full day kindergarten program that's been implemented province wide? Oh, well, let's see. Um, I haven't really been ever asked that question. You know, I think um, the whole day kindergarten, and um, you know, I, I would say I don't have a lot of expertise with that. I think the most important thing I want to go to on that is the teacher preparation and mm -hmm. the support for teachers and being able to do that. And an interesting thing I haven't addressed at all, and it, it might come into full day kindergarten and what you do and what, how the play based and what is important, what we know about early child development and how young children learn is, um, as I was sort of, I was sort of saying before, is we don't, um, how much do teachers get preparation in helping um, deal with those, help cultivate those skills, help be able to have the support and able to help children um, thrive in that situation. So to me, a lot of it, I guess the full day kindergarten would be like a full day school, whatever, it would be to really help support teachers so that they are able to do um, these kinds of programs. And I guess that's the one thing I, I thought when I heard about full day kindergarten, now first of all, I have to tell you as a parent, when children started kindergarten, when my kids had half day, it was a bit of a nightmare, you know, just working full time. I just have to say that, you know, that was one issue that have to, I mean, I know parents would talk about that. But the um, full day kindergarten um, and the focus on how do we use that as an opportunity to help promote these um, social and emotional learning skills, you know, and that's something where we know the research says it could do it, but how much do teachers that are teaching in those grade levels actually have the support and the background to be able to do that. And, and for that age group, what's appropriate? What would be a caring environment for a day? Exactly, a day and the idea of how play-focused, and we know how important um, yeah. the scaffolding of a Gottsky approach. The, you know, the other thing, I mean, play-based learning and the idea of how uh, child-centered approach and that's developmentally appropriate and how mm -hmm. important those are where mm -hmm. children can thrive. The BC Principals and Vice Principals Association did a study after one year of full day kindergarten and they were asking some of these questions and I think you can get it online. Janet Mort mm. did the study and um, just, just looking back over a year to see how kids did. But um, so that's kind of worth looking yeah. at. They did, they did better than people thought, that's for sure. Mm -hmm. Next question. Um, when you're talking about social emotional learning programs, you're talking about some specific type programs that mm. people can actually implement. I just wonder if you could talk a little bit about how people could access some of those programs, where those resources are. Thank you. That's a great question. Um, and uh, so, so first of all, I want to talk about, you know, we talk about programs and some people might say, oh, a program, it's like a box program isn't a way of being. So I have to say it's both. You know, so, so before I tell you where the program is, it's you can't bring a program in um, without having a caring, safe, participatory context to help, help do those things. But what we know um, uh, from the research, there are some evidence-based programs which you can access. So I first have to go back to CASEL, 
um, which is the mothership of all things social and emotional learning. And on the CASEL website, they just released on Thursday their recent, um, basically they're the kind of um, consumer reports of evidence-based social and emotional learning programs. And you can go and see their latest report of all of the programs that they have rated um, and how they stack up for both preschool and elementary school. And that's the US, but it's castle.org. Yeah, W-W-S-E-L. -E yes, and so that's one place. In Canada, very interestingly, there's no place to go to find out where the programs are. You just really have to, um, Castle is the place that they, you go, or you go to, um, Another place called, um, uh, oh, what's it called? Uh, for Youth, oh, I'll try and remember what it is. It's For Youth Gov. We'll put info. some of these resources on the website. Yeah, we should by do that. Video. I'm just trying to think of the other one is also What Works Clearinghouse, but Castle would be the pl go to place. They have a, 200 and, uh, a 2003 2004 Safe and Sound Guide with a list of all the different programs, and then this recent one. And um, there's, there's a range of programs. Um, there's some, you know, what's also interesting, there's not a lot in Canada that originated in Canada. Roots of Empathy is one of the few that actually grew here. Um, and I have to say what's really critical for all of them is evidence-based. The idea that there's research supporting it. And the Friends program as well. And the Friends, yes. The fr who's, who's there? Friends. The Friends for Life. Yeah. The Friends for, it's interesting, the Friends program was not listed under CASEL because it's not in the US. So it's, it's, in, it's in Canada and it's in Australia and other countries, but it's not there. So the Friends for Life, that's a provincial uh, program that Maria has been doing lots of work with the Friends yeah, program. It's an awesome program, resiliency building, anxiety reducing for children. Yes. Yeah, universal program. Yes, yeah, definitely worth going. And there's a fun Friends program for children and there's, there must be parenting uh, yep, there's a parent aspect too. There's yes. a new website coming out. Do you want to talk about that for a second? There's a new website coming uh, for uh, a Friends for Life website as well. So, yeah. So it's a wonderful program. Right, yes. And there's strategies within those. I mean, that one of the things is that you don't have to wait until you get a box program to start to do, use these strategies at home or in school. Mm -hmm. And you said that it, it, if the, care, the environment in the classroom, for example, isn't caring, then that box program isn't going to be as effective. Right, and, and it just makes me think that, um, so there's a couple of other places that you can go. Again, I'm just going to give resources. Edutopia. Has anyone ever heard of George Lucas? <laughs> so George Lucas, the George Lucas Educational Foundation, identified, um, uh, is, has a program called Edutopia, uh, a website, and you can go there, and social and emotional learning is one, and there's videos and teacher resources and a number of different things. Um, but it makes me think that one thing I didn't say, there's a recent article I read um, for teachers, but also for parents, about four ways to show you care to children. And if you want to know the four ways. This is a wonderful way for actually for us to close out the evening because yes, children exactly. don't always know you care when you think they Right, care. so four ways to show you care. The first one is to find out about children's interests, to actually listen to them and ask them what they, what they like, what they don't like, what their favorite things are, and really take the time to get to know each of them. Um, the second thing is to um, really listen to children, to actually, um, when they're talking to you, to actually really you know, get to their level and listen to what they're saying. Um, the third thing is to give them opportunities for choice, that you show your care when you actually listen to them and say, what would you like to do here? What would, what would be your idea? So as a teacher or as a parent. And finally, um, one of the most important things you could do to show you care is to practice self-care is to take care of yourself um, so that you'll be there more present for children. So it really, you know, it sort of ca encapsulates a lot of what we talked mm -hmm. about tonight and, and this idea of, of caring for self in order to care for others. And so the, I think there are one key message you want us to leave us all with. If there's one thing we can't leave tonight without knowing. Relationships. <laughs> so I will say the two by ten. One thing, so I'm giving you all a task to do. Let's see, what day is today, Thursday? Okay, next Monday. Um, those who are teachers, those who are parents, um, more for teachers, but parents could try. Um, what the research found is if you take, I don't know if any of you have an annoying student that you work with or? No, no none, I know. They're not the people who come to the Dalai Lama Center events, of course not. Um, is find 
uh, that annoying student and for two minutes a day, for 10 days, have a conversation with him or her that is about his or her interests. Not the, don't sit in the chair that way, did you hand in your homework, but something else where you notice them, where you try and find something about them that you like or that you want to know more about. And uh, at first, they might look at you like you're an alien or someone has taken over your body. Um, but really, just keep at it for just two minutes. It's not too much to ask across 10 days and see what happens. You know what? I think that's a great thing for parents to do, too. Yes, parents I and grandparents. Agree. It doesn't matter if you can't, you're not, you don't have a child you can't stand. It's not that. No, I know. <laughs> I didn't want to leave. <laughs> just your child. Your child. Two, you said two minutes, two minutes a day times 10 days. Yes. Just ask just them having... something about themselves. Yeah. And ask them something about um, not a sort of, did you clean your room? Did you do your homework? Did you bring your dishes to the sink? Did you, you know, none of those. Yeah. But something like, you know, that's such a neat, you know, you know, drawing that you did. Yeah. Or that's, yeah. And not how was your day. Right. That'll <laughs> no, be fine. Tell you. Yes. Kim, thank you so much. Uh, you are human Google. <laughs> thank you for being here and for sharing some concrete uh, ideas with us. Well, I'd like to add my thanks to, uh, to what Marie has just said, Kim. Um, you are a remarkably passionate and knowledgeable person and very, very generous in sharing your knowledge and understanding. Um, many of you probably have heard Kim present before or have seen, uh, seen some of her research. And uh, certainly as we listen to her tonight, and certainly in my experience, because we have lot, I have lots of contact with Kim, thankfully, um, I always learn something new, always. And, uh, and I'm sure that's the experience of everyone here this evening as well, that, that uh, you, you, you just seem to be able to draw from uh, such a range of practical experience. Kim's research lives in our classrooms in British Columbia. And it really reflects the reality that uh, we have in our own province and, and within the Lower Mainland. And as well as that, to be able to draw on the research of others, of her colleagues right around the world. And Kim is certainly recognized around the world for what she does and the connection that her openness to learning from her colleagues about what's really important in supporting social and emotional learning of children is just remarkable. And we are so lucky to have you here in Vancouver. Thank you so much, Kim. And as well as that, I'd like to thank Maria. Once again, you've done a remarkable job in moderating. I love the questions you ask. Uh, I work closely with Maria, and she asks questions a lot. And they're wonderful, because she's always curious and always processing what, what people are talking about and just wanting to dig deeper and dig deeper to understand. And so it was uh, wonderful to watch you doing that again tonight. Thank you so much.